I'm at the Antique Wireless Museum in North Bloomfield, New York. Go in and see what there is. There's like 6,000 square feet of space in this, this main building. They have uh, four or five buildings. Some are storage, one's a library they're working on. This is a uh, 6,000 square foot building. Oh, And uh, so we bought this building five years ago. The museum itself started way back in 1955. And it's in this blue field because the two engineers, uh, electrical engineers, and were hams and worked for Kodak. And so uh, Bruce Kelly, W2ICE, he was looking for a place which he found in Bloomfield that had a big barn. So this is a demonstrator. So Tesla says we're going to electrify New York City with no wires. So we demonstrate electrify all wire bulbs with no wires. That's the way he did it. So. Yeah, hold that for a second. The <laughs> So here we have a display of mobile telephone technology over the years. Starting back in the 40s, the two chassis receiver and transmitter it even has a dynamotor, that big black thing in the middle. It's one of the early Harris uh, low band uh, mobile telephones. What's really interesting is that this one here um, was the first uh, cellular and mobile. This was built and designed by AT&T. They got Oki Data out of uh, Japan to build 100 radios and it was controlled with the Bell Labs computer on the bottom. So this was the first, as we know, cell phone or mobile phone. And it's serial number one. And over here is you know, basic handhelds, including one of the original uh, brick types. And a collection of the uh, more modern handhelds, including an Iridium satellite phone. So now we're looking at the Armstrong exhibit and got a lot of his early work here. So this is his first regenerative receiver built in 1912. You can see the tube in the top and the way the regenerative worked is a little bit of the output of the tube was fed back in and that created it to amplify. If you did too much it squealed and that became a transmitter. And on the bottom shelf here some of his original FM transmitter uh, pine boards <laughs> that were used up on the Empire State Building. That is before Sarnoff threw them out. Aren't familiar with Armstrong's history? It's well worth doing some Googling. It's very interesting. Inventor of the regenerative receiver, the super het receiver, and FM, both the transmitters and receivers. So, very interesting pass. So this is a display of some of the early Marconi equipment, including the Marconi radio men, because Marconi owned all the equipment, leased it out to the ships, and supplied the operators. So here's a very early 1908-1910 wire recorder, and what's interesting is that this handset that goes with it was on eBay about a month ago, and one of the members bought this for $13. Nobody else knew what it was. So here's the world's first vacuum tubes. The one on the left is a Fleming valve from 1905. The one on the right is the uh, DeForest Audion tube from 1907. So now we're in the military room. Here's a World War I kind of looks like a field station. There's a transmitter out of an old British bomber. Various receivers and things and more of World War II era radios. And this is a uh, transmitter out of a B-29 and a couple of these ended up in Russia so they basically duplicated and the transmitter. 
to give an idea of kind of the restoration that they perform here at the AWA, this is the way they receive this radio. And then one of their members completely rebuilt it and did a beautiful job. 1924 RCA prototype receiver. Here's a very early uh, television camera, very rare. There's a 500 watt transmitting tube removed from a Japanese battleship. So this is the ham room with the spark app and some of the early tube equipment. We progress up through the ages with Collins. Here's a KWM1. This really changed amateur radio. One of the most popular transceivers followed by the KWM2 and all sorts of Collins, and Heathkit, Helicrafters, Drake, and then the Japanese, here we got Kenwood, and Yesu, Tempo, we got some Swan up above here, Singuni Box, Johnson uh, Matchbox, Antenna Tuner, Bob Hiles always talking about the central electronics. So here we go. Okay, this is a 10 watt spark gap. To save the spark, the uh, carbons, because it was expensive. Right. So uh, with a synchronous motor, they could uh, get the spark and had the chance to cool. At the same time, it made a, a tone. Right. And so now we started to hear, so we knew who was sending. Okay. Very cool. <laughs> see a thousand watts? A thousand watts. Spark it. and a collection of QSL cards. I even know a couple of people on that wall. It's kind of hard to see with all the reflections, but this is a blueprint from Marconi of the Olympic and Titanic, and it shows where the radio room was to be installed on the ship, as well as the antennas. Very cool, very rare. So here's a replica of the Titanic that radio room. This is the receiving room. As accurate as they can uh, build it. Some more equipment up on the wall here. The keys. And this is the 250 watt spark gap transmitter. And this these big controls here would allow it to be switched between six different wavelengths. I mean, this was state of the art. And they have a few, what they call unusual tubes on display. The ones on the left are basically American design and the ones over on the right here are more from Europe. They have a couple hundred thousand tubes out in storage. So here's the little sound corner with a bunch of the original uh, photographs. And up on the top, we have RCA, the little nipper. Let's take a listen to these old machines.
this 1930s. Turn up the volume? Sure. Open the doors. There's a display of early televisions, the rear projection, <laughs> RCA, we got the various uh, spinning discs. There's a cabinet with the uh, CRT facing up because the neck of the tube was so long. The mirror was used so you could watch it. So we have a 1927 homemade <laughs> television receiver, spinning disc, and you kind of watch whatever image there was would show up through that lens. Here's a 1926 Dumont prototype. And in there would be a, where you would see the little picture. Now here's a Jenkins uh, spinning disc. Which image would uh, bounce off the mirror and appear on the front cabinet. Let's take a look at inside the telegraph office. For the telegraph office, uh, this represents a typical small town 1920s telegraph office. This desk, as you can hear, is actually operating. Uh, it's set up as a four wire desk. There are four wires coming to the desk. Two of them are operational, the other two are at the moment connected to nothing. We're looking at eventually putting them to other locations within the museum. But the two that are running are actually connected to the internet. We have an internet telegraph system. Mm. Uh, on Saturday afternoons when I'm here, between about two and three, I'll be chatting with people all over the world using it. Uh, and what okay, you... this is very interesting, and uh, thanks for all your time. And well, this will be up on YouTube here Okay. In a while. So. Thank you much. I'm this glad you fun. enjoyed it. Okay, thank you. So we're in the teletype corner. Lots of various machines in here. Oh. And the one in the wood box was part of the uh, White House Moscow Germany uh, hotline. And over on the end here is a Model 28 waterfall multi printer monitor set. So here's a Model 28, and these are really neat to watch the head move. My friend in Rochester used to have, have one of these. We'd run them on 146.70 teletype bubble start back in the 70s. And that was neat. All sorts of old terminal units. Here's HALs, they were very popular. A Dubtron with a scope. Showing the mark in space and some other uh, terminal units. That's two five thousand. Help teleprinter. This is the Voice of America exhibit out of Delano, California. This equipment and a lot more. It was shipped here, delivered here on three tractor trailer loads. So they have one of the consoles here, basically kind of lit up and running. And in the background here is a uh, 250,000 watt Collins shortwave transmitter. 1963. This is Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. Now this is Ted Sorensen, special counsel to the president. This is a David F. Powers, presidential assistant. These are the transmitting tubes that are in the transmitter. Another view of the transmitter. 
This is the uh, control panel. Shows kind of a, a schematic of uh, the stages in the transmitter and all the controls and metering along those stages. Or um, indicator lights, I guess. And some of the back side of it. Some of the tuning equipment. Shelves here from the Dr. Berman collection from Switzerland. The 1935 Zenith Stratosphere radios. Only about 30 of these were built. These sold for $750 in 1935. And occasionally one of these appears on eBay now for asking price of around $80,000. Zenith, 1935 Stratosphere. Three speakers, 25 tubes, 750. 1935 when a Ford two-door coupe cost $500. This is more of the Dr. Bourbon collection. Big old Dumont <laughs> television, 1948. Well, you were hot stuff if you had one of these, because I'm not sure what you were watching. More of his collection. When he passed away, uh, this, was all, uh, this was all donated and shipped to the Antique Wireless Association. This is pretty unusual. This is a Strongberg Carlson made here in Rochester, New York in the 50s. Hmm. Why? How would you like to have one of those? Here we have a whole collection of helicrafters. I mean, it's just amazing. Like some uh, test equipment, a helicrafter signal generator, and a vacuum tube voltmeter. And then we're, oh, we got some ICOM here. Need some older equipment. National. HR, oh yeah. National collection here. More shelves of radios. Some Collins. That's fair, Kenwoods. Reels, table radios, Heathkit, HW16, all sorts of Heathkit. Here's a HW10, HW100, one of the most popular Heathkits probably ever sold. This, I believe, is a very rare receiver. It's a Collins. 75-3C. More ham equipped hammerlins. It's like some CB. Oh, this is very, very cool. The so way radios were built. You build it yourself. A little bit later on, you actually got into some metal chassis. Of course, everything was open. This is, this is before TVI, television interference, was a problem. When television came along, we had to shield everything up. All right, look at the transmitting tube in there. Isn't that cool? This just came in. It was home brewed by Charlie Preston, K4LJH. It's a thousand watt linear amplifier with a 750 TL tube. Man, look at the craftsmanship. Man, how would you like to sit home and have this transmitting and have that tube glowing with the filaments on a cold winter's night? Oh, that's a big tube in there. A 750 TL. Shelves filled full of Zenith radios. Including a lot of the little transistor ones. So these are all different manufacturers. You know, remember we used to buy a five transistor or six transistor radio. You know, one on the ends of nine transistor AM FM. A whole shelf of the old novelty radios, Sinclair, Coke, gas pumps, the Kodak battery, the film box, <laughs> Tropicana, a Welch's grape juice radio. And this must have been a ham radio with the pig. Big old Zenith console, also from the Switzerland collection. The dials on these old radios were really neat. The push buttons here on the, on the right for memories, for WGR and CBL, different stations. You could tune in. So here we are in the 1915 radio store 
You go in here and buy your radio or buy your radio parts. Tubes. Tubes, oh yeah. And yeah, need some batteries to run it. Check the date line, see if they're fresh. And you can buy your radio parts, your tubes, your condensers, your sockets. You can even buy your grid leak. There's a lot of people built their crystal radios. And with the Galena crystal, the cat's whisker, find the sweet spot to make it run. And your radio workbench. Get your equipment there, your, your pliers. <coughs> So there's a soldering iron, you probably would heat that up with a torch and use that then to solder your connections within the radio. So you got a pair of needle nose and diagonal cutters, nut driver. Hey, this was it. Look at the test gear, Weston meters. Here we have some TV cameras from the Rochester television stations. And of course, all the drug stores used to have these things, tube testers. You'd, you'd bring your tubes in from your television set, and you'd look them up there on the chart, you'd plug them in, and it would say replace or good. And if you need a new tube, they were stored in the bottom. So you wonder where all these have ended up. And I guess you're going to have to buy a new tube. This is the first transistor radio built by Bell Labs in 1951. The guys were uh, sitting around listening to, to a tube radio and somebody says, why don't you build it using transistors? So that's what they did. And there's the inside there. So number one transistor radio. And this is the transistor radio that most people know of. The little shirt pocket, five and six transistors. Here's a Radio Shack one, still running. Just keep a supply of nine volt batteries. So this is a 1939 Circa Philco radio, but what's very unique about this is that it's the first radio with a remote control. You would dial up the station, has like a telephone dial in there, and then it would tune the radio. And so this is a Cape Heart radio, but what's interesting is that the record changer in here would hold five records and it would play both sides of them and flip them over so you get about one hour playing time and this was popular with the opera crowd very neat okay. so here's a whole display of radios that were made in Rochester Strongberg Carlson and RF Communications or as we know today as Harris were big manufacturers here and I remember these uh, marine radios that were uh, taken out of service back in the 70s when we went from a wide band to a narrow band. And these were very popular with the hams in the area here. A lot of people had these underneath the dashboard in their car when I lived back here in the 70s. RF Communications uh, transceiver. And RF made a lot of military type equipment. So 